glory of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. If you want to hear the news bulletin of the day, it goes something like this. Yesterday, 70 degrees at Reagan National Airport. Today, five inches of snow. And from the sublime to the ridiculous, it seems. But so is the case, perhaps, with the scriptures, especially if we misread them. For indeed, today, in the middle of Lent, we have a glorious story of 70-degree weather, if you would. The unbelievable, profound, unfathomable grace of God bestowing upon us warm riches and delights beyond all imaginations or understanding. If God had not revealed to us how wonderful His grace was, we could never have imagined it to be as wonderful as it is. Yet, the, the winter weather that comes behind it reminds me still of more Lent to come. Not that Lent is not a time of grace, all times are times of grace, but that we are ever more reminded that we go through a darkness, a winter, if you will, of life, as we stray away from that very same grace. I love what we have here today in our bulletin and in our insert, that one famous, famous verse, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. And we have it on our bulletin cover written one way, and then in the beautiful cross in your announcement bulletin inside, not knowing that I was going to preach this, of course, uh, our secretary, our church secretary, Elise, did this on her own without any prompting, without any request, but therein lies the hand of God. For it didn't take any real genius to figure out either that this is the most profound verse of all the reading we have today. We have a Romans reading, we have a magnificent psalm, and we have this deeply profound gospel reading that teaches us of grace. And I have to start by asking a few things here. And there are things that we can each ask in our own soul that lead us into what Jesus is teaching us by the message of grace today. And likewise, Paul in the Romans reading, another fine lesson of grace. What I want to ask you is this. What has God done for us? Do you know what God has done for you? Do you know what God has done for me and for all of us? Do we know? Now, the quick response to that would be a, a mental ascent to say, yes, of course we all know. We know about the cross. We know about Jesus coming in the world. We know about resurrection and Easter. We know it all. I understand you probably do. You probably do. But if you do, my next question is, does your life reflect it? Are you living a life of grace that comes from knowing what God has done for you and for all of us? Does your life show that? Are you taking comfort and ease in what God has done? Now, if you're wondering why I'm wondering, it's because I live with a, a personage inside my own mind and heart, and because I'm a minister to whom many people come. Whether it's in my office or in church, or I go to their homes, or wherever it might be, I'm with these folks. And I hear things that break my heart. And they break my heart because they're not living in the truth of God's grace, but they're living in the lie of the world, the lie of the evil, and the lie of the devil, of Satan, the lie. The big lie. What is the big lie? It's the performance lie. We're living, ever hear that phrase before? We're living in a performance lie. A lie that you have to perform to be good enough. Perform to be accepted by God. Perform to make your way to heaven. And we all buy into that, it seems, at one level or another. While there are some who have perfected the idea of living in grace more than others, I see young mothers who come to me and say things like, my children aren't doing well. I think I wasn't a good mother, maybe, or I'm not doing my best. Can you help me with that? I feel so guilty. My kids have problems, and I'm sure it's my fault. I have others who come to me and say, I'm not the provider I should be for my family. Would you help me to understand what's wrong with me, because I should be a better provider? I see people carrying around to-do lists that hang over their heads like term papers at the end of a semester when there's three days left. You gotta get this term paper done and handed it in or you're gonna flunk the course. If I don't do my to-do list, I'm gonna mess up. I'm gonna do poorly. Well, we need to understand something. Jesus, in essence, is giving us the green light of the gospel today to stop beating ourselves up. He's telling us that we don't have to be so hard on ourselves. Don't stop beating yourself up and stop beating yourself down because it comes in one version or another by this lie that my performance makes a difference as to whether or not I'm going to heaven, whether or not I'm having everlasting life. My performance determines whether I can live in joy or live in peace or what happens with all of that. Because indeed, 
the world is singing an unrelenting chorus at you and at me, and that chorus is saying very simply, you've got to work harder. You've got to do more. You have to perform better. You have to get going. Instead of remembering that master's course you never completed, that thesis you never did, that ultimate job you never reached, that high note of life you were trying to hit but you missed it, and you're beating yourself up over it as if your performance is going to turn what happens for your life. Self-reliance, self-dependence, really, really bad things in your life to be that way. I know we have an Independence Day on July 4th, and the popular American thought is independence is a good thing. Independence is not a good thing when it comes to the Lord God. I am to be completely dependent upon Him, completely humble, completely humble before Him, so that humility says, Lord, all you have for me is enough. Humble, Lord, all you have for me is enough. And faithful, Lord, all you are is where my trust is. So that all He has and all He is is enough for me. And then He answers back in grace and says, everything I have is yours. It is my good pleasure to give you the kingdom, and I give you everlasting life. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that good? Isn't that good news in the gospel today? We can stop beating ourselves up, beating ourselves down. We can stop being so hard on ourselves, because we have a Savior in Jesus who has done for us that which we could not do. My goodness, my acceptability, my wholesomeness depends on what He did, not on what I do. Now, that doesn't excuse me from trying my best. I should try my best. But I'm going to fail. I'm going to miss the mark. I'm going to mess up. I'm going to do it tomorrow. I'll do it before I go to bed tonight. I'll do it a year from now. But it's okay in the Lord. I can turn to Him. I can tell Him I'm sorry if I've aggrieved Him. I can say to Him, will you help me if I've just fallen down? And He loves me. And He'll come and He'll pick me up and He'll take me along. This John 3.16 is almost impossible. Like I said, had God not revealed it to me, I never would have con conceived of it. I never would have thought of it. It's just too unfathomable. It's too good to be true. They say there's no such thing as a free lunch, that every time you get a free lunch, get ready, because here comes the pitch. Here comes the thing that they want from you. Well, with Jesus, there really is a free lunch, a free Eucharist, a free heavenly banquet, a free eternity. And he says to me so beautifully here, God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And he said that God gave his son before he went to his death. But it was kind of a foretelling, I'm going to the cross. God gave his son, for God so loved the world. What does the world mean? So the world means like commerce and everything out there? No, the world is the world's people. He loves everyone, and what he meant in that context, I suppose, is not just the Jews, but all of us. He's telling his hearers, God loved the world so much. He had other sheep too. He loved the world, and he gave his only begotten son. And I have to believe in him. Believe in him. Even if I just believe in you, Lord Jesus, I get to go to heaven with you? That's right. But understand what believing in him means. It's not just mental assent to his words. It's just not agreeing with Jesus' words. Like I said earlier, does your life reflect what God has done for you? So that when I believe in him, I'm not just believing that his words are correct. I'm living my life as if they're correct. I have faith in him. I'm humble. I'm saying to him, as I said before, Lord, all you have for me is enough. In fact, it's way more than I expected or deserve. And all you are for me is what I trust in and have faith in. And he responds in grace and says, then you shall have it all. You shall have it all. If you want me, you shall have it all. That's all I ask of you. Living in the grace of God is a magnificent thing and it goes day by day. But we have to understand the importance of the message here that doesn't just hang on that one verse, that 16th verse, but also wraps up in the story of Nicodemus. For indeed, Jesus is saying things to Nicodemus that Nicodemus is being blown away by this Nicodemus, this teacher of the Jewish people, this man who came to Jesus in the dark, I guess because he was either ashamed or frightened to come to him in the daylight when others would see. He didn't want to fall out of favor, perhaps. But he comes and he's asking questions. And he's asking this question about this ridiculous notion, how can I be born again? I can't climb on my mother's womb. And Jesus starts talking to Nicodemus. And he says, Nicodemus, hang on a second here. And what we have to understand, you and I, is this idea of being reborn again, to be born again Christians, isn't just something that goes into cultural and societal notions 
of these kind of right-wing, fanatical, born-again folk that people mock all the time, although I suspect a lot of those people are, are fully reborn, and that's why we need to hold our, tip our hat to them and hold our heads up and respect them. But being born again is real of Jesus. It has a more glorious meaning than just the cultural reference of somebody who's a little over the top about their religion. For to be born again is the essence of why I live. He says, I need to die unto myself so that the Spirit can live in me. So the Spirit of God can come and I live a different way. Again, that question, are you living your life differently because of what God has done for you? For if you truly appreciate, I truly appreciate what God's done for me, I'm humbled to say, Lord, I want what you give me. I'm faithful to say, you're enough. And I ask for His Spirit to live in me so that I live a different way. I'm a kingdom citizen. I'm not just an American citizen, but I'm a citizen of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And I live a different way. I live in the Spirit of God, for what is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the Spirit is spirit. And I want to be spiritual. I want to be better than I could be. I want this grace of God to invade my life. And in speaking to Nicodemus about this, Nicodemus is confused. And Jesus says to him something that's really important for you and me. You need to listen to this. This is really important. He says, Nicodemus, you don't even believe the things I'm telling you about earthly things. You don't even believe the earthly part. How in the world are you going to believe the heavenly part, the eternal part? He said, what does that have to do with us? You said it has something to do with us. Well, here it is. If we don't live our everyday lives believing in what God has done for us, and being kingdom people, and living in the Spirit, how do we live our lives eternally? Just as Nicodemus couldn't understand earthly things, so how could Jesus explain heavenly things? How can you and I expect the grace of God to carry us for eternity when we don't want to recognize the grace of God in our lives? I'm not saying that you won't go to heaven if you somehow mess up the way you live your life here. But I am saying that the idea of eternal life has started already. When you were conceived in your mother's womb, your eternal life began. And eternal life is not something that begins at death. It's already here. The kingdom is already established. The spirit is already available to us. We can live that way now. I can look at the way God uh, has done things for me, and I can say in response, such grace is unfathomable. Lord, I want to live and walk with you in your spirit. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do, to live heavenly lives on earth, to be people who are different to the world. For what good does it do us to say we claim Christ in our hearts, well, for eternal life it does us some good, but in this life, what good does it do us to claim Christ in our hearts but act like everybody else in the world. People look at us and say, you people are Christians. You beat your chests and proclaim this Jesus Christ. But I notice you don't live your life a speck differently than I do who do not know Jesus Christ. I don't know Christ, and I live the same as you. So what benefit have you by Christ? And the person might have a real point there. There should be a telling in my life that the grace I've been given has come so that I live a different way. For example, I ask you this. Do you live in peace? Is your life restful, joyful? Are you content? Do you reflect some of the fruits of the Spirit, like patience and in gratitude and to live things in generosity and to live life differently? Does that describe your life, those things I just said? You say, well, no, as a matter of fact, restfulness, peacefulness, contentment, lack of anger, self-control, these things don't describe my life. Okay, again, don't beat yourself up over it. Don't be hard on yourself about it. But understand, maybe you're not living in grace. Maybe you don't have that peace because you're living in this self-reliant, self-dependent lifestyle where you're trying to be your own savior. He has done unbelievable things for us. And by faith, we can claim them and live in grace. Grace isn't just for when we die. We can live that way right now. In the Romans reading today, Paul says something gorgeous to us in that 16th verse. It seems like the 16th verse is important to both these readings today. He says, it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring. It depends on faith that the promise may rest on grace. Faith and grace, faith and grace. In the Romans reading, in the gospel reading today, we get the idea that it is not what I do, but what Jesus did that helps me and gets me along. If you do live in self-reliance, if you do live in self-dependence, I pray that you will be broken. And you say, well, God, that's a horrible thing for you to say as a pastor. I pray you'll be broken of it. And you say, why? 
Because in your self-reliance and in your self-dependence, or my own for that matter, what happens is that I ignore grace. I don't live this life in the way that I'm intended to live. And I can't do what Jesus was saying to Nicodemus. I can't live the earthly thing well enough that I'll ever understand the eternal thing. When by living the earthly part of it and taking grace in my earthly part helps me to understand too what grace there is for the heavenly part. It's not that I just have a mansion over a hilltop somewhere. I have it right here and now. I have the goodness of God in my heart. I can accept it in childlike faith. I ask you this, why is it that a six-year-old child hears a song like Jesus loves me, this I know, and embraces it? Why is it that many adults in this room when they were children heard Jesus loves me and latched onto it and thought it was just grand? And yet we have such a hard time hanging on to the song Amazing Grace. Oh, we sing Amazing Grace, we understand Amazing Grace, but we don't always live our lives the way that it is, the way that it plays out. We're accepted the way we really are, but we go on with these internal monologues in our minds. You have these monologues in your head where you talk to yourself about your, your wrongdoing and the things you messed up on, the things you feel guilty about, the things that you swung and missed about. Does that go on in your head? I give you a practical handle here, a little practical tip to take with you. Every time you catch yourself talking to yourself about how you are inadequate, or you weren't good enough, or you missed the mark, or talking to yourself about being self-reliant or whatever, stop right there and instead talk to God. Continue the conversation, but stop talking to yourself and speak to Him and say, Lord, here I go again. I'm talking about how low down I am. I'm talking about how I'm not up to what is at hand here and how I'm trying to be the hero and my own savior. Will you please help me? For God will answer you and say, you can take your ease. My grace is with you. Just as a newborn baby has to do nothing for its mother to love it, neither do you. Can you imagine a newborn baby having to perform in order to get its mother's love? It's incapable of the task. Same thing for me. I'm incapable of pleasing God without God's help because I'm sinful and broken. But I don't have to beat myself up about it. I don't have to condemn myself in it because he's here to love me anyway as a mother who loves a baby who cries and has colic and acts out, throws oatmeal on the floor, whatever the baby does, the mother still loves the baby. Huh. It's really amazing what happens like that. I had a woman, a young woman, came to see me some time ago. And as we sat and talked, she came to counsel with me because she had a horrible childhood. People in her household as a child told her she was no good. She was bad. They marginalized her, made her feel low. Told her again and again, you will never amount to anything. You're stupid, they would tell her. You're stupid. Imagine your parents telling you you're stupid. She grew up thinking this way about herself. Desperately seeking love as a young adult woman, she made a lot of bad choices. She did a lot of bad things. She really kind of lowered her morality, I'll just leave it at that, and walked into a way of life that was absolutely degrading and brought even more condemnation upon herself, if you would and went through this to a point where she had nowhere else to turn. She was desperate for something, she was alone, she was forgotten, and thought she could turn to God, except for one problem. You know what one problem was? She felt too low to go to Jesus and say, would you have me? She felt unfit to turn to Jesus and say, may I be one of your saved sheep? And she had come to see me to speak about this. As you can imagine, we didn't get it done in one session, it took a while. But eventually we came to a part, point where she could look at him and say, Lord, I don't want to beat myself up anymore. Will you have me? And by grace upon grace, she felt the loving embrace of Jesus, turned her life to him, and lives a life of faith and grace now, fully redeemed in her heart that she's loved, putting aside all the degradation and guilt of the years gone by and the way she lived her life forgetting what people had to say to her, because there's only one voice she wants to hear now, it's the voice of Jesus saying, I love you, and you're fine by me, and my grace is sufficient for you. These scriptures today, amazing and powerful. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Put your own name in that sentence, get into it, say, for God so loved Ed, for God so loved Ted, for God so loved Pam, for Bob, God so loved Bob. Put your own name in it and you'll be doing well. That God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. 
And then we begin to understand what it is that God has really done for us. And when we realize that, we can stop beating ourselves up, we can stop beating ourselves down. We can stop being so hard on ourselves and accept this beautiful, warm grace, the 70 degree afternoon of sunshine of grace that comes to us from a God in heaven, who yes, we do not deserve, but who loves us so much that he came seeking us for the ultimate price. Now there's the good news of the gospel today, isn't it? Amen.